So good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Heart Community Group hosted conversation. Uh, and this time I'm delighted to welcome Ruth, Ruth Clark from Harpenden, um, who we met um, at a couple of events uh, that were happening in her school, which is Sir John Law's school in Harpenden. Uh, Ruth is 16, but I'm gonna ask her in a moment to um, say a little bit about her journey uh, from the time when she first became aware of what was going on. And it's a real treat. I was just saying to Ruth before we hit record that um, I'm used to speaking with old crusties like myself, and it's, it's really nice to get a different uh, perspective. Um, and I have such admiration for Ruth and her colleagues and what she does. So Ruth, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, just tell us tell us a bit about your um, when you first became aware um, of what was going on with the climate and ecological emergency, and uh, yeah, your kind of your your story and and then what you've been involved in at the school. Uh, so I really became aware of it in I think twen winter twenty eighteen or early twenty nineteen, which is when the whole student strike movement was kicking off uh, with Greta Thunberg when she sort of came into the limelight a bit. Um, before then I hadn't, I mean, I'd obviously, I knew about climate change and I'd understood it, but I wasn't really acquainted with um, climate activism um, and all that going on. So yeah, I heard about it. Um, my mum and my sister, we all heard about it. We saw the first one in the news and we were like, great, that, let's get down there for the next one. <clears throat> so we started attending them. Um, and then from there, um, there were more students in my school who were attending those strikes. Um, and so a teacher at our school, Miss Brazier, who I don't think is here uh, tonight, but um, she's been wonderfully supportive and she got a compiled a list of the students who were going on the strikes and said, right, she got us all into a room and said, let's, um, let's make a, a group out of this let's try and um, initiate some action within school because you're clearly all passionate and you're all dedicated um so that was really how I first got into climate activism and from there well I guess I've just been attending the the club at um, our school with a bit of patchy attendance here and there I think I think through Covid I kind of I wouldn't be surprised if if many people who were who are passionate about the climate crisis suddenly became a bit too overwhelmed with the with the feeling of um just general depression and um there was just too many problems that seemed in the world so i think it got put on the back burner and a lot of burnout really happened with the student strike movement that were sort of died off a bit um but it's sort of regenerated a bit after covid um and Nowadays, we're doing lots of interesting stuff at the Climate Action Group. So uh, recent initiatives include the um, Intergenerational Climate Conversation Cafe that was set up by uh, one of my schoolmates that um, I met Kim at. And we've done also workshops um, with younger students talking to them about the climate crisis. Um, an initiative I haven't been involved with um, but it sounds great that's been going on in our school has been a uniform swap shop so that's to try and improve our school's own sustainability but instead of sending uniform um, to landfill that it's been sort of being given out to students who need it um, so that's just a, a small run through of, uh, my relationship with climate activism right okay thank you thank you very much so my next question was going to be but you kind of already answered it yeah, I'm sorry no, that's fine. To what extent is your immediate family on the same page as you? Yeah, so my mum very much so. Um, my sister, who's two years above me, very similar boat. She she was sort of the leader of the, the climate action group before she left the school. Um, however, my dad totally is now, but he, I think, came from... a it's strange I think most people I think or the stereotype is that you start off more liberal and left-leaning in your younger years and then you become more conservative as you get old, older which is a trope that I kind of hate but um he's he seems to have gone on the opposite trajectory and 
which is <laughs> which I think um, the rest of his immediate family has to take some credit for. But he's um, I think at the start he was obviously always supporting of the student strike movement and the climate movement but he was kind of that thought he himself was like a centrist sort of he felt a bit squirmish we dragged him along to some xr things and he was he was supportive but he felt like he was sticking out like a sore thumb i'm sure he didn't really blend in maybe um but he's he so that's probably the person who's been least um initially completely entirely on board but it's very heartening to see that he cares so deeply about it once you have conversations and yeah I think it's a good sign that many people who aren't of just a single like um political profile that you know if if you communicate effectively with them then they can learn and change um their opinion on this particular uh, issue so yeah yeah brilliant oh that makes such a difference I think I speak with a lot of people all the time every day who who say one of the one of the most challenging things is people in their family not getting it. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm, I'm very lucky to have had a supportive family. And I think, yeah, especially my mum was the I felt um, with this with the school strikes, our school actually reported it as an, an unauthorised absence instead of an authorised absence. So that came up red on your attendance, like the same as if you'd gone on a holiday or something. Um, and I, as quite like a generally law abiding, <laughs> rule following citizen at my school, I was quite like um, squeamish about this, but she was the one who encouraged me to see the, <laughs> see the bigger picture and, uh, you know, break that one particular rule. So she's been more than supportive of this issue. So I'm very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's great. So can you say a bit about your emotional journey through all of this, Ruth? Um, because you know it's uh, it is it is it is emotional. You know um, we're having to come to terms with a future that looks very different from the past or the present. Um, yeah, talk us through how that's been for you. How's that felt, and how's it feeling now? It's very hard. I think it's something that is still obviously I'm, I'm grappling with quite a lot. Um, the teen, I've, I read something about um, that the teenage brain is even more predisposed to sort of see things as catastrophic. Um, so that's not a great mix with a genuinely catastrophic um, event happening. So it's, there's obviously moments where it's very hard and you read about stuff in the news and it's not getting better and it's entirely doom and gloom and it, it's, it's a bad situation. You've got to hold your hands up and accept that. Um, but I think what's helped me personally, and like instead, it's a hard hard to find a balance between like thing you know carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders and being so entirely depressed about a, a bleak future and then sticking your head in the sand and ignoring it, which is what what most people do. I think for me personally to find that balance between those two undesirable extremes, I have something that's helped me is researching about it um and then that has been a productive outlet um so i did an extended project qualification which is basically like a, a long essay which is worth about half an a level i wrote that and researched a lot around the climate crisis and democracy in particular and different forms of government and that how they could um maybe create a better response to the climate crisis or and it was very interesting for me to do that and I felt like it was a productive way to spend my emotional energy mm. rather than just worrying. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So what is it, this is a hard question. What is it that you want to happen? I mean, I know that sounds bleeding obvious, but like <laughs> if you, you know, if you were prime minister, if you had a magic wand, like what, what, what needs to happen because um you know some many people would say well simply simply getting off fossil fuels is going to help but it's it's not going to turn this around now like what what are you what are you hoping for well this is a quite a hard question and i'm not sure i'm the person most educated and will be able to give the best response but 
I know you, you guys are, as a community do um, think a lot about adaptation um, instead of just mitigation. And I think you're certainly right that that's something that's not spoken about enough, not focused on enough. Um, and so the first obvious immediate thing would be to yeah, get off fossil fuels, make all these changes and from a mitigation perspective, um, but putting in adaptation measures as well uh, at this point seems um, very much necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, well, I think probably what I'll do is open it up now. And um, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'll, I'll, I won't be selfish. And I'll, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll ask them. So the rest of you lovely people, um, anything you're, you're curious about, just stick your hand up or unmute yourself. Yeah, Ray. Ray, unmute yourself. I love the facial expressions of people, don't you, on Zoom when they're trying to work out buttons. <clears throat> this is... Oh, well done, there you go. No, you had it and then you turned it on again, off again. Bottom left corner. No, okay, we'll hold that thought. Who else has got a question as well? Yes, Philip. Yes, well done, Ruth. Um, you're obviously very committed. Um, but how much um, public engagement have you been involved in? Because it seems to me that's a big problem that uh, uh, as we've seen recently, not everyone is convinced that um, green policies are a good idea. So um, how are you trying to get your message across? Um, that's a very good question. And it's something that I feel like, like you is the crux of the issue really in terms of making progress from where we are now. Um, so the what we've done within our community is um, host uh, an open, we called it an intergenerational um, conversation cafe, and that was basically invited um, after school one evening, parents of students um, and teachers, although uh, interestingly, not a single teacher apart from the one who helped set up this group attended. Um, and you should have seen the number of them that attended the senior boys um, football matches. Um, so <laughs> that's shame on them really for that. But um, oh, actually, our head teacher did arrive to take some pictures and then leave and post about it. But um, <laughs> anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent there. Um, we so we invited parents in, um, and then we had some guest speakers, um, and then at the end, it sort of we went into smaller groups and had more of an open conversation. Um, that was a really good example of engagement, but I think it had the same issue which all these attempts sort of have is that we were kind of preaching to the converted all the people who had arrived at that event were self-selecting already cared about the environment um so we were kind of all going around having slightly differing opinions but broadly agreeing with each other so it's not engaging on the level you know with the people who are still skeptical about um climate action so i think that's a problem that's very hard to tackle. Um, there was a bit of it, we do like strikes in, in Harpenden Town Centre and on a couple of the strikes I've tried to engage with passers-by. I had, a, a, I think it was a questionnaire, it was a while ago, that I was asking them to fill out. Um, and then you did see a lot more of a mixed response from the people just in the town centre. They were not willing to give up their time. They, I doubt they were in a rush. Some of them maybe were. Um, some quite hostile responses um, from some people. Um, some people were very supportive, which was lovely to see, but it's, I think it's, um, it's, that is an issue that we haven't quite cracked is how to speak to people who don't want to speak to us. 
but um, maybe a focus on trying to do outreach with people who aren't invited, rather we go to them is, is something that we could work on, I think is a very good point. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, I mean, it's interesting if you, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the Climate Majority Project that was started fairly recently by Rupert Reid, but according to the research that we've done for that, um, the majority, like 75% people in the UK are serious, either, either concerned or seriously concerned about climate change, but they're not, that doesn't mean that, the, that they're active. So, you know, and, and it's, it's back to this problem about, yeah, but what can I do? Um, so his belief, Rupert Reid, is that there is already a fairly silent majority. And the people who are doing the kind of backlash, the anti-green stuff at the moment, are a minority, but a very vocal minority. Um, so that's interesting if you look at the kind of statistics on that. Thank you. Ray, have you found your button? Okay. Sorry, Christine, I'll come back to you. There we are. Got it. Go on, Ray. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hovering around this business of whether it's worth speaking to some people. As soon as you detect a bit of opposition, a bit of hostility, do you just shut up and go away? because you're not going to convert anybody, particularly if you talk about things like the whole capitalist system has got to go. You don't say that to people who, you know, where you detect any uh, sort of scepticism about um, the situation or about what people can do. And I'm sure most people are defending their lifestyles subconsciously and can't, they're afraid to think about having a simpler lifestyle. So the wording is very important. And I do like um, this idea that people can have, can thrive when they consume less. And I just wonder whether that idea has come into your head, in your groups and your friends. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point to raise. Um, especially with teenagers, you they are concerned about fashion, <clears throat> about trends, about their lifestyles. It's, I think, um, as, a, as a particular demographic, it might be harder to convince them than most people that they need to let go of a sort of consumerist lifestyle. It's, it's quite a lot of, well, I mean, all my friends, me as well, I it, indulge in really. So, it's it's a tough one but I think it's such a correct message I think that um me personally I think an, an example of this is that um I'm sure you've heard of TikTok the social media app I used to have that a, a while ago um and I'd scroll on it and I'd get loads of advertising about different fast fashion pieces that I'd want to buy um and I was ended up buying a lot more and spending my money in a really bad way um and always being unhappy about trying to keep up with something else I've deleted it for quite a few years. I'm much happier. I don't spend my money. I don't, I'm not even aware of what the particular thing is I need to spend my money on because I don't have <laughs> the same level of the people telling me what I need. I, I now need. So I think that is just a small example of how thriving on less is, is actually really true. You don't need this stuff that they keep convincing you that you do need. Um, so I think it'll be hard to, to get that through to um, a teenagers. And I think you're fighting against the very determined and powerful capitalist interests of these big businesses who want to sell you more stuff. But um, having conversations with people I know, I think, you know, maybe small lifestyle changes could be implemented or at least people could be content with the idea that if it did have to happen, they would accept you know, living with less. Mm. But, yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Ruth. I mean, interesting to reflect on the fact that apparently during, you know, World War Two, during rationing, uh, there was less depression, less suicides. Um, and of course, people were much healthier because they weren't eating so much crap. Um, 
And the other thing, just as a quick plug for another upcoming conversation, uh, if you're interested in sustainable fashion, uh, we have Belle Jacobs, who is a complete expert in that area. She used to be a fashion edit editor of Vogue or something and had a complete Damascus Road experience and is now going around, especially talking with teenagers, uh, helping them to um, see through, um, you know, well, first of all, see through the, the advertising and the sort of consumerist pressure, but secondly, um, to you know make make really wise decisions about when they do buy something how they buy it and where they buy it so if you have a look on the heart community group web page you'll see that conversation coming up thank you who's next uh yes christine yeah thanks uh this is uh, you're absolutely right this is my biggest bugbear my biggest problem is talking to the right people um as uh, kim knows I, I run a, a thing every year, call it the EcoFest. It's not supposed to be jolly. It's just supposed to be, you know, um, trying to do our bit. So that's mitigation, but also trying to look forward to what you can do um, in the future, as it were. But um, getting to talk to these people, getting to... I, I view my public coming in to speak to my... I have a set of stalls, you know. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do an indoor one um, in November, uh, just before COP28. It's supposed to like make people think about it, but um, which is where I started really with these. Um, but the people who walk past, some of them are complete uh, anti-believing in climate change. I'm sure. And some are uh, very committed and some are wavering. So I see it as useful to talk to all these people and to have them talking to the various people who make things to replace plastic, who um, you know don't make um, decorations out of plastic, all that sort of thing. Uh, and um, insulate the houses properly, et cetera, et cetera. The mitigation. But I hope the rest of it comes through. It is very difficult to get that through. And um, I hear what you're saying about, uh, you know, talking to the right people. How do you grab them? How do you get them? I think your international, inter, what was it? International um, Climate yeah. Cafe it is a great idea. Uh, Interage. Yes, yeah. yes. And I must try and do that with the local schools. I mean, I do try and work with the local schools, but they're very difficult. They're very busy. And I, I don't have an inside contact, contact, as it were. I don't, I'm not a friend of anybody. Yeah. Now my kids are so old. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, to sort of lean on them. But um, I think that's where it is. And interestingly enough, just um, uh, an extra little bit, I think it was you and me today. I don't know if anybody else heard it. Uh, it's the programme that's on BBC Radio 4 at um, 12. It was all about um, clothing. Uh, I think it was entitled Looking After Your Clothes Better or Making Them Last Longer. But it was all about, you know, what can you do to make them last longer and how do you resist buying so much and so on. It was, it was all there. So, you know... I shall be recommending to my uh, lot that I email out to, to listen to it, but whether they will, mm. who knows? Mm. Sorry. Thanks, Christine. Lovely to see you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, Mike. We're having problems with with mute buttons tonight. Right. There you okay. go. Ruth. Um, so uh, I've been in Friends of the Earth since I was your age, probably. And uh, I'm in various other groups. Um, I mean, one problem that we're having with, with climate problems is is that the, the 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 mass media have, have managed to get extinction rebellion and, and other groups such a such a terrible reputation 
Um, but uh, in, in the Green Party here and uh, and Greenpeace, I mean, if, if you have a meeting, the sort of people that are at this meeting are the people that, that turn up. I mean, the average age is probably about 60. And, and I can't imagine very many young people would want to join a Friends of the Earth group where nearly everyone was uh, over 50. So, uh, so what do we do? That's a very good question. Um, I think maybe just accepting that there, there might be a different group that would appeal to students or setting up a specific, you know, younger people group that was advertised directly towards them. I think you saw in the in the student strike era in, in like 2019, um, you had UKSCN, there was a huge uptake amongst young people for this type of conversation. They it was not that they didn't they they're not interested or they don't want to have it. I think it's that it's currently not really it's not that it's not for them, but yes, it's there's an issue with sort of widening the demographic as well you know, um, racial diversity, income diversity. I think you probably have a lot of middle class people who are sort of privileged enough to be able to care about something that's more far on the future. Um, I'd sort of fixing this problem. I don't know if I have the answer to it, but I think maybe advertising conversations um, with speakers that are younger for people that are younger getting a contact as Christine was mentioning to a university or depending on what age you're looking at or a school um, and they will probably have pre-existing groups that are sort of working within those structures that you could if you could try and sort of converse with you could set stuff up in partnership with them there are groups existing of young people that do care and do want to do stuff but they're busy doing stuff like this on a you know in their own time as well is maybe is maybe not appealing to them so finding a way that can sort of be compatible with their schedule or their um, aspirations and I don't know if something it's helpful for them to like for example put on their personal statement if you're running a workshop that they can speak about on their CV or something um, that might be a good way to like have a bit of a pull factor there but I ultimately i'm not too sure what can be done about that no, no we can't really compete with fashion and uh, and holidays and things <laughs> yeah yeah um, i think on some level it's going to be hard yeah but uh, somebody said to me that perhaps a lot of young people are not interested in joining existing groups um but they're doing a lot on social media but i don't actually I don't actually notice a lot on social media that's coming from uh, teenagers. Yeah, it is. I do. I think it is an odd one because you saw a real spike of it um, and student strike movement. And it's all there just seems to be a lot of burnout. I don't know if if teenagers have much capacity to to care about it and to think about it, because once you start doing it, it's, you know, it's quite Very depressing. I think maybe there's a level of resentment that's like, well, our future is going to be worse than yours. And what, you know, you're expecting me to to do something about it. It's no, I didn't create this problem. So. Yeah, I remember that when we met before, there was a lot of people your age who felt, yeah, quite angry, actually. And I can understand it that somehow the young people are expected now to step up and fix it, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, but I mean, there's a there's a question just on the back of Mikey's, which is, you know, you've been in all of these organisations since you were Ruth's age, Mike. Yeah. We're going backwards. So it's kind of um, the thing is, it I'm, was not, I'm not sure it's getting more and more groups to do the same things we've been doing for forty years, you know. No, but unfortunately, yeah, uh, it, it was uh, fashionable uh, yes, it was. a long time ago to be in in uh, in something like Friends of the Earth. And uh, I mean, I don't I don't want to be negative, Bruce, but there were apart from the Friday strikes. I mean, there was a lot of there were 
there were a lot of them for for a few months and then it all sort of died a death here there was a big black lives matter rally in town um and they got several hundred people there but but after the, once once it wasn't once it wasn't happening all over america and things like that anymore it just completely died a death no one was interested within you know there were hundreds of people on their facebook page, or you know people that that on their facebook page but but within a few weeks uh, they've never they haven't posted anything for years you know it, it was it was a big thing while it was fashionable and in the news and then it, it just completely died a death which which is a, well a tragedy really and I, I realize that most young people are very very busy especially if you're still at school or university or whatever i mean not you know you're incredibly busy but uh but nevertheless if 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 if, if young people don't get involved in the future then we you know it's gonna it's gonna be much worse isn't it yeah you raise a lot of good points and i think a lot of the roads sort of lead back to social media and the impact that that's having um you have a sense of people feeling like they've they've done their part of activism because they've posted about it it's quite happening on quite a performative level um you have trends like micro trends like emerging with you know people have got such an influx of information that it'll be one thing is really fashionable and then like you say i'll just move on to the next and people are genuinely thinking uh what can i care about what can i do but what they're getting told to care about and do is changing is so, it's overturning so rapidly that it's no one is kind of getting committed and stuck into it back you know like they're used to which is a shame and I'm not sure how it can be tackled apart from looking at social media um what it's doing to young people collectively is it's pretty scary so um finding ways to minimize their their usage of that and uh, regulate it more so it's not corrupting people's attention spans in the way that it's currently doing I think a lot of work needs to happen there before you can get a sort of deep and meaningful connection with you know the issues that people want to um, campaign about yeah mm. thank you thank you yeah Christine and then Kathy Ruth you speak so powerfully uh, I'm so impressed. Now, I, I joined this meeting like a minute or maybe two minutes late. I'm not sure because I couldn't find the right thing. Sorry. But uh, did you say at the beginning how how involved the rest of your school has become with all this? I mean, you are the perfect example of somebody who's really enthusiastic and trying to get people to think and do. So how have your peer group reacted? Because I'm thinking I should go into the go into the local school myself. I, 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 I know they've got a green group, you know, but I should go and, and you know, not, not bully them, but really encourage them to think and their teacher to, to do it. But how's it gone in your school with the rest of them? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question and it's, it's been a mixed bag, really. Um, so you've got a lot of people with their hearts in the right place. We've got an excellent um, climate action group where there's people who who turn up and they we do meetings and we have these different initiatives that we plan and then we put into action and they will come and they're committed. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful to see. Um, however, that does remain a minority of people who are who are willing to get involved with that um and you it's i the membership has actually declined since 2019 when it was fa fashionable really when it was the student strike sort of era yeah. since then it has become a smaller group um and we we don't get that much support from teachers apart from the wonderful miss brazier who I, I don't want to lump her in with them um, and the rest of them because that seems unfair on her after all the hard work she's put in but it's kind of like this group was set up with loads of people who are passionate and want to do something about it but a cynical take on it is that it's sort of set up within the school within the structure so I think it was kind of set up so they could keep an eye on the kids who were ditching school 
and going to London on the school strikes. It was to try and co-opt them into going to strikes in their lunchtime in Halfenden Town Centre, which isn't a strike of your striking in your break time. But it's there is definitely that element going on, which is that they we look good for them. They can tweet about all the stuff we've been doing. And then actually, if we were to try and push for much within our school community, um, it, it would be you know not allowed shut down not supported um I there might be we've had a change of head teacher um and he I think seems more open to new ideas so there might be a bit of a change with this going forward maybe that'll be a positive story but I think by and large our school community and then also my peer group people care they think oh you know yeah but they don't really care deeply a lot of them um it's it's quite hard it's it's quite rare basically it's there there's good points there's positive points but then there is a lot of what you would expect which is that not too many people care the existing system of our school is quite resistant to change um so it's it's a mixed bag you you've got highs and lows really with that yeah yeah oh <laughs> Quite, yeah, it's quite depressing. Um, Cassie, then Nikki. Hi, Ruth. Um, I also joined the meeting late. My computer was playing up, but I got it to work now. Um, this is quite a nebulous question, and I don't mean it to be a pejorative question either, but um, I've been listening and I've heard you say a number of times, you know, um, what I'm told, i.e. by TikTok or social media or by the tutors, and I know from my own experience of social media, which I'm pretty bad at, um, how isolating it is because you're just in your own home, in your own bedroom or whatever, you know, texting away there or videoing. Um, and I think I, I don't have children, so I don't know many people your age. So this is um, just my question, really. I mean, I know a lot of mothers who have been what I would call taxi drivers. You know, they take their children to pony club or ballet or karate clubs or whatever, football, you know. Um, so my question is, is as a teenager, um, even in your school, but just as a teenager generally, would you say that teenagers today are perhaps comfortable in social gatherings or do you, would you say that more people are comfortable with being you know in a in a um what's the word um you know a non-real communication via text because i ask it because um you know there's all this stuff in the media about teenagers mental health and everything else and um mike mike's experience you know, when and my experience when I was younger was you had to socialize in order to meet people. Otherwise, you were just stuck with your brother and sister you might hate, you know. So um, whereas I think now one of our difficulties is is people don't perhaps interact as much. Would that be reasonable or am I just being off beam? Um, no, I, I think that is reasonable. I think, again, it's such a mixed bag um, in terms of how people have reacted to social media <clears throat> personally. I find it a negative impact on my life and I, I still have it because it's sort of a social requirement mm -hmm. but exactly. um, I still benefit a lot from having in-person interactions and I think if you're still in school or university or something you are you're forced especially school because it's mandatory education until 18 you are still forced every day to interact with a large number of people you go there and there's a thousand people or whatever so it's not that people I mean apart from COVID which was a, a blip it's not that um young people aren't actually sort of having to speak to people they don't um you, you know more like they they do go out and speak to people but i think you are very right to um to worry that some people are becoming in, in increasingly uncomfortable with that um some people do prefer interacting over social media um it's really, it really is a mixed bag. And I think it, it comes a lot with if they have pre-existing like social anxiety or 
or any other mental health issues that may mean that they would find it uncomfortable to socialize in large groups and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the number of people who were struggling with that did grow social media is isolating and it is I mean it's a it's a it's a whole nother topic really but um yeah it wasn't so much it isn't so much for me the sense of large groups like you know I could go you know a teenager might go to a horse riding club or something yeah um you know because that's that's a focused activity so people are going to enjoy it together sort of thing um but it's like the depth of communicate the depth of relationship between younger people you know if I mean, I'm I'm considerably older and, and I, I still feel quite trepidatious about going on marches and stuff mm. because I live on my own and I think, oh, you know, mm. but when I meet other people, which I've done, you know, I, I feel I well, OK, if I go with them, maybe I can do this. Yeah. And and that's the sort of and and by doing it, obviously, the my relationship with those people deepens. And I, I just wondered. You know, because we um, you were your generation appears to be told what to do a lot <laughs> you know your 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 studies are much more constricted than what mine were and um yeah it just worries me because i think we're i i feel that um companionship stroke camaraderie at, at some depth you know if you do it i think i can do it sort of type mentality is helps us to stand firm in ourselves it helps us give us individual authority really whereas if we're always being told what to do or constrained in what we're allowed to do um that that inner authority is undermined and i think our government is particularly keen on doing that on some level or other but so i, I just wondered you know how you felt how it felt to be a young person today in such a world because yeah. if we don't join up in solidarity i can't see much happening <laughs> Sorry to be negative. <laughs> no, no, I I think you've got a very strong point there. Um, I think it's something that is you can see changing the sort of sorry, can I just have a drink? I've got something in my throat. Yeah. <clears throat> I think an example of this might be that my, my dad was quite outright. I've been looking at university open days, I've been going off to different parts of the country and doing an open day there at university, and my dad was sort of outraged to hear that when I came back after with my first one saying oh everybody else's parents were there with them I was literally the only person sitting in the lecture or <laughs> not with a parent and he was like oh you know yeah you, exactly. you need to be able to to feel like you can go out and do stuff yourself and I think that is a with social media <laughs> again it feels like a buzzword tonight but um it, the world seems like a scarier place. I think people are a lot more aware and acutely aware of all the dangers and the strangers that are mm. around them. Um, and so it's become a lot, I think parents have become a lot more nervous and anxious over their child's well-being. And so mm. that means that their child internalizes that and then feels like they they can't do stuff independently so much. Um I think I think you are right to say to observe that that is going on and I think it might have negative impacts in terms of people being willing to yeah go to a, a, mm. a march or a group of people who are strangers and just be confident in not knowing anybody else there I think that's a hard thing to do mm. but I I hope that it won't undermine it too much because if their people have got a friend and they'll go along maybe they'll that it'll still all tick along smoothly and it won't completely you know stop strangers from meeting um, new people but I don't know I, I think it is an issue and I hope that it can be resolved. Thank you. Uh, thank you Cathy. I met some of my best threat friends on marches. Um, Nick, uh, Nikki. Yeah hi um, actually Cathy's point in the middle there is, is um, sort of gelled something. I was going to ask you Ruth about um, you said that no other teachers came to the intergenerational cafe and it was a bit disappointing I, was, I wanted to ask you just a general feeling about um i work in a primary school and it is very much eco club and one or two tas who are interested and but i would have hoped that when you get to secondary school there's a bit more of an of a um general conversation about it not in a crisis sort of way but just a general conversation of 
times are changing, advice is changing, lifestyles need to adapt. You know, that I would have hoped that it would be sort of part of normal conversation is, am I wrong? <laughs> um, I think there is definitely a conversation, but it's probably um, many years behind where it needs to be. Um, in terms of we have we have the same we have um eco schools the climate action group uh, sorry um, was set up to be different from that sort of uh, generic like planting trees and eco garden thing they've got going on which is lovely but it's not really the issue that we're looking at um but i think mainly the dialogue that is exists in our school which there there definitely is people do assemblies on it we have like sustainability leaders with student students um in lower school and stuff like that but i think yes it's very much one or two teachers who are interested and who are pushing this agenda and the general conversation is still being very much like individual action what can i do i can recycle i can take a two minute shower instead of having a bath and it's like we've heard this all before and it's not looking at the large scale stuff I think the climate action group is a group of students who are trying to do something a bit differently um, and put a slightly different message out there but I don't know I think there's still lots of students the youngest younger students who are within within our group who are still thinking along those sort of eco group sort of lines um, but yeah so the so the dialogue and the conversation isn't quite where it uh, would ideally be but at least it is happening it is like not completely un goes unspoken about but yeah so I can be more positive <laughs> oh no it's, it's, it's very interesting do you think um framing it as a crisis do you think that's the wrong way to go about it you know um I know that at the at the cafe there was a sense of when Kim spoke, and I'm not just saying this because she would, she's here, but I did hear someone say, what a breath of fresh air to hear it talked about in a very sensible, matter of fact, honest manner, rather, you know, ah, we're all gonna die. It wasn't like that. It's just these yeah. are the facts of what's happening. Um, understanding that in a calm and balanced way rather than, even rather than marching and, protesting sort of getting a more sensible sort of conversation going with peers and teachers you know yeah I think that's definitely something that should sorry to cut you off there um I, no, think, I realize I asked you a question I'm just talking at you <laughs> no, but I mean I'm just talking at everybody else <laughs> but um I think it's definitely something that that needs to happen because part of the issue is that if it has this sort of history hysteria that surrounds the issue people have a bad reaction to that and they think oh no and it kind of alienates quite a lot of people through speaking about it in like hyperbolic but may maybe accurate but like um sort of alarmist way mm. if you speak about it in present your it in a factual way um if you quote studies i think that in actual scientific information that you can give to people i mean i don't know how much how much of a long way this will go because people have probably already been trying that but um i think in a school setting in particular that might resonate more with students who are concerned about seeming appearing a certain way if they had, if they sort of associate themselves with a particular group i know i definitely got a bit of stick for it people do make fun i'm, I'm fine with that but i think it could be off-putting for some people so trying to yeah seem appear as as rational and straightforward and as honest as possible is is definitely a, i think a good way to approach it for younger kids who are concerned about who they're associating with. yeah yeah and Thanks. the sorry um Go and on. for parents as well i think um you're a great example ruth that you've gone away and you've researched and you've looked into the science and you've you are so well informed and you can speak so confidently and authentically about it. And for a, your parents, that must be fantastic because that you can have sensible information backed conversations. And maybe that's something that needs to happen in a wider context so that parents aren't frightened for their children. Yeah. yeah. So maybe the young people can lead that. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's 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 different views on this, isn't there? Um, I think it's I think it's 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 not good to be hysterical. Mm. Um, but this is worse than a crisis, right? So it's like, and if we're going to be truth telling, then I I don't think it's a sensible idea to at all dial down how alarming uh this is and and you know um and and it's also interesting the research on information giving we know now beyond a shadow of a doubt that the biggest the biggest thing that creates that creates change in somebody is them seeing what other people are doing right. it's it's not giving them more information more information, you know, is just doesn't hack it. It's kind of in one ear and out the other. Um, and so, and and again, you know, we've been trying that for forty years, so we know that doesn't work. But yeah, the biggest single way to get somebody to change their behaviour is have people around them, have them see people around them doing stuff. Um, and and that's why you know a lot of the things you're doing, Ruth, are so great because people are uh, people are seeing that. But yeah, I, I uh, there was a there was an MP, a Liberal MP in Australia. I don't know how many of you picked up this story. Who said that um, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be uh, scaring young people? Um, and she even said this. She said talking to teenagers about climate change was tantamount to child abuse. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I Agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So I just wondered what you what you thought of that, Ruth. This whole kind of, I I think you know, depending on age, it's got to be age appropriate. But your age, I I think young people deserve older people to tell them the truth. Yeah, I I strongly agree with that. I think this is a conversation that needs to happen, as you sort of point out, on on many different levels. I think you want to make people feel as though it's not you can do something, not that you can do something and then everything will be completely fine um, and magically fixed. But I think especially with young people, if if there's a tendency for them to sort of think of things in catastrophic terms, if you start uh, just going in hard with the catastrophic information, it's easy to switch to nihilism and just think this is terrible I accept it's bad but I can't bring myself to care about this because if not care but engage with it because it, it makes you want to switch off and just head back in the sand my life is fine at the moment and I don't want to engage with it anymore so I think with with teenagers there's a hard line to walk between being honest and they do it 100% deserve to be honest but presenting that information in a way that is follow, comes quickly followed up with but here's what can be done on a wider level here are the conversations you need to be having here are you know um and I think yeah in terms of seeing people doing stuff um and that being the most powerful way to change people's yeah. minds um ideally it would I think just thinking of it in my school community if you were to see, uh, I think the thing that would affect the most change would be to see a, a group of people who are different from just the people who go to climate action group engage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they become profiled as people who care about it and that's good for them, but that's not us. And so I think that trying, I, as, I think that's the thing that the climate action group could try and do is doing stuff with the wider school who aren't the regular members I think yeah. that's a really good point yeah. fantastic gosh well I, I don't know I'm sorry Ray is it a quick one Ray science has been mentioned briefly I wanted to put in a plug for a BBC program which came on Sunday evening it was just called heat pumps but it turned out to be a survey survey of all the technologies which might get us to net zero when we um, in terms of greening the national grid. And I, I, found, I found it very helpful and very well done. 
Okay, thanks, Ray. Thanks very much. Um, well, <laughs> thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, uh, again, um, very, very impressive. I wish you and the, and the group uh, every success in what you're trying to do. Do shout if you'd like any extra support or help um, or ideas or resources. Um, and I'm not sure I understood the word nihilism when I was 16, so good on you. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody else for coming. Really good to see you all. Um, and uh, let's let's give let's give Ruth a round of applause, shall Yay. we? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, I'm stopping the recording now. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you.